Pea plants and many other types of plants have genes that contribute to how high the plant will grow. But plants also need water to grow. In plants that get water, you may be able to see the difference between a plant with a tall allele and a plant with a short allele. Plants that do not get enough water will undoubtedly be stunted and grow much less than they could have if they had water. This is just one simple example of how the environment can change the phenotype of an organism. In fact, environmental effects on variation account for a large portion of the variation seen in most traits. Some environmental variables simply change the phenotype without altering the genotype in any way, while other environmental variables actually alter the way DNA is expressed. These concepts will definitely be on the AP test, so follow along as we break down the complex effects that the environment has on various phenotypes. In this video, we're going to take a look at Unit 5.5 of the AP Biology curriculum. We'll start by seeing how we can measure environmental effects. Then, we'll see how some variations have a clear evolutionary purpose, while others are simply coincidental. After the first quiz, we'll define epigenetics and see how gene expression can change due to environmental inputs. We'll spend some time at the end of the video going over some extra examples of environmental variation. If you only need to review one of these topics, skip forward to the time outlined here. Otherwise, let's get started. Let's start by seeing exactly how the environment can affect an organism's phenotype. In many cases, environmental effects on phenotype are common sense. For example, we know that people come in many different shapes and sizes. To start with a simple example, let's think about how an environmental variable like food can affect a person's height and weight. We know that someone who has plenty of food and overeats will become fat. By contrast, someone with not enough food will likely become emaciated. Thus, it is clear that food has an effect on the body type phenotype. But did you also know that high quality nutrients can affect a person's height as well? Much like plants need water in order to grow to their full potential, animals, including humans, need high quality nutrients in order to grow to their full potential. In fact, scientists credit food production and availability as one of the reasons that the average height of people has generally increased over the last hundred years. However, we also know that different populations of humans increase and decrease in height at different rates at different times. So, how can scientists possibly know how much of a trait is determined by the environment and how much is determined by genetics? Scientists start with the following equation. Total variation equals environmental variation plus genetic variation. Knowing that the total variation is made up of these two components, we also know that the total variation minus the environmental variation is equal to the genetic variation. This equation allows us to determine how much variation is due to the environment and how much variation is due to genetics. First, we need to experiment to find the environmental variation. Consider an experiment to determine how water can affect plant height in a group of cloned plants. We give one group of clones as much water as they can handle. We give the other group of clones barely enough water to survive. At the end of the experiment, we can measure the variation in height between these two groups. Since these plants are clones, they have the exact same genes. This means that the amount of variation is due entirely to an environmental variation and not at all to genetic variation. Then, we can go out and measure variation in a wild group of plants across areas with all different levels of water. If we know that the total variation and the environmental variation, we can then calculate the genetic variation and the contribution of both environmental and genetic variability to overall variability. Think about this. While some phenotypes are changed by environmental conditions that do not necessarily change the way a cell functions, most variations caused by environmental changes actually change how the organism functions. This is important because it allows organisms to react to environmental changes. In turn, organisms can express a phenotype that is more likely to help them survive in given environment. 
Keep this in mind as we continue. The answer to the question, why does the environment affect phenotypes, is not an easy one to answer. Consider the following. The hydrangea plant produces flowers in many different color varieties, ranging from pink to dark blue. However, only one of these varieties, the white hydrangea, results from a mutated gene. White hydrangeas produce no pigment molecules at all, whereas the other three varieties produce the exact same pigment molecule. Surprisingly, this pigment molecule responds to aluminum ions in the soil. The availability of aluminum ions in the leaves is dependent upon the soil pH. When there is an acidic soil pH, aluminum ions are easily absorbed into the plant. These aluminum atoms create a chemical reaction within the pigment molecule that causes each pigment molecule to reflect blue light. If the exact same plant is transferred to a more basic soil, then aluminum binds to hydroxide ions in the soil and cannot be transported into the plant at all. Thus, the pigment molecule is never modified and remains a red color. At a neutral soil pH, there is a small amount of aluminum in the plant and some of the pigment gets modified, leading to the mixed purple coloration. So, while scientists have answered the proximate question of why the environment changes phenotypes, there is still no answer to the ultimate question of what purpose this change serves in the plant. As of now, there is no known evolutionary advantage to having a flower that serves as a functional pH test. However, as we will see in a few slides, there are many environmentally caused phenotypic changes that do have clear purposes and increase in organism's fitness. Now that we've covered what environmental variation is and how it can take place, let's see if you can answer a few questions. Pause the video now and take this short quiz. You can find answers to all of these questions through the quick test prep link in this video's description. To see a purposeful and driven form of environmental variation, consider the snowshoe hare. Like many animals that live in cold, snowy regions, the snowshoe hare goes through a seasonal molting event. Though the hare is pure white during the winter months, the hare will become brown in the summer. These two different color phenotypes help the hare stay camouflaged in both seasons. This is known as phenotypic plasticity. Unlike some of the environmental variations we have seen, these changes are epigenetic. This means that signals in the environment actually change which genes are expressed in different environments. In fact, scientists have identified over 600 genes that change their expression pattern due to signals from the environment in the hair. For instance, as springtime starts to replace the winter weather, several environmental cues hit the rabbit. There is more sunlight, more nutritious food starts to sprout, and the temperature starts to rise. These environmental changes stimulate a number of signal transduction pathways that, in turn, lead to changes in the expression of a large number of genes. For example, genes related to hair growth are turned on, as are the genes related to the production of pigment molecules. This leads to the molting phase seen between the summer and winter phenotypes. However, it also affects genes related to the metabolism and the release of hormones that trigger the reproductive cycle. Ultimately, all of these changes lead to the phenotype of the hair that we see in the summertime. Unlike the change in flower color we observed previously, these environmentally driven variations have a clear evolutionary advantage. They not only keep the hair well camouflaged in all seasons, but they prepare the hair for different seasons and ensure that the hair is reproducing at the appropriate time of year. Before we go on and look at more examples of environmental variation, you may want to take a quick break. Grab some water, stretch your legs, and get your blood pumping. When we come back, we'll look at several other examples of environmental variation. Let's go through a few quick examples of other forms of environmental variation. Let's start by taking a look at the process of skin tanning. Tanning is a form of phenotypic change from lighter skin to darker skin, stimulated by UV rays. Contrary to popular belief, all people undergo the process of tanning, even if they already have naturally dark skin. 
Dark skin and tan skin are both caused by the pigment molecule melanin, released by melanocytes located several cell layers deep within your skin. Melanin makes its way through the skin cells to the surface of the skin, where it can block harmful UV rays. In fact, the process of melanin production is stimulated by UV rays passing through unprotected skin and creating reactive oxygen species in the cells. These reactive oxygen species damage the DNA and stimulate signal transduction pathways that lead to increased expression of the melanin gene. However, this process takes about 10 days to become fully activated after initial sun exposure. That is why many people get a sunburn on their first exposure to the sun, instead of instantly getting more tan. This redness is extreme damage caused by UV light bombarding your skin cells. Considering that tanning can only happen after UV damage, you should always wear sunscreen and consider a spray-on tan to avoid the possibility of skin cancer. Let's consider another interesting type of environmental variation, temperature-dependent sex determination in reptiles. In mammals, sex is determined by X and Y chromosomes. In birds, a similar but opposite set of chromosomes known as Z and W determine the sex of each individual. However, in reptiles, each individual receives the exact same set of chromosomes. If the egg is relatively cold as it incubates, the chromosome will create male hormones and the offspring will be male. If the egg is relatively warm as it incubates, the chromosome will release female hormones and the offspring will be female. In the nest, this works out well because parts of the nest are relatively warm while other parts are cooler. This creates a mixture of male and female offspring from each nest. While this temperature dependent form of sex determination has worked out well for reptiles for hundreds of millions of years, global warming may lead to more females and fewer males, possibly endangering the survival of many different kinds of reptiles. Now that we've covered epigenetics and have seen some more examples of environmental variation, let's see if you can apply your new knowledge. Pause the video now and take this short quiz. You will find answers to these questions through the quick test prep link in this video's description. Be sure to check out all of the other study resources we have created for you if you need some extra practice. Thanks for watching. Please like this video if you found it helpful and informative. Leave us any comments or questions you still have about how the environment can affect phenotypes. Be sure to subscribe to the Biology Dictionary YouTube channel to find all of our AP Biology videos and study resources. Good luck!